presentation is entitled Motivation, Innovation, and Differentiation in Your Beginning Band. It is sponsored by Stanton's Sheet Music, and our presenters are Richard Cantor and Josh Van Order. Let's give them a warm welcome. Thanks, Lydia. And uh, we want to say a special thank you to Stanton's Sheet Music for sponsoring this session. Really great. And thank you for coming. Um, this session was not listed in band sessions, and so I know, like for me, when I'm looking for sessions, I just go straight to band. I don't go to general sessions, and I don't go to showcase sessions because they're trying to sell me something. So ironically, we're going to try to sell you. Just kidding. Uh, so, but anyway, um, uh, all things, uh, you know, all joking aside, um, if you leave this clinic feeling like you have more tools in your toolbox, that's what we hope for, um, because we're going to we're going to show you some things that are. Uh, hopefully a little bit different than what you're what you're doing and some things that you may have already been doing that uh, that are just simplified a little bit so it makes it a little bit easier for your teaching so first of all uh, before we get started um, just a, a quick show of hands how many of you uh, well how many of you teach beginning band I'm assuming all of you. great okay how many of you teach like an intermediate level band maybe an upper junior high level cool. how many of you teach high school band? great okay how many of you have beginning band five days a week yeah. Well, that's nice. That is nice. Good for you. How many of you have uh, beginning band four days? Okay. Three, two, one. Ah, great. Okay, so this should be really great for all of you, and particularly if you have band one or two days a week, uh, we're going to find a way for you to actually be able to individually assess your students, which is something that can be very daunting. Um, a little bit about us. Uh, you know, I've been I'm in my 16th year of teaching. And uh, several years ago, um, I developed this, uh, this, this program, and it was, it was much more uh, uh, you know, basic at, at the onset. And uh, I actually I went through, um, through a series of revisions, and, uh, and, and after piloting it with some local directors, I went to Josh, because Josh was um, in his first year in a, in a new program, and I knew what a great director he was. And going into that new program, I said, hey, Josh, I want you to take a look at this, this thing that I put together. And uh, you're a good friend. I want, I want you to tell me what you think. And he, of course, said, no, um, <laughs> which is what good friends do, right? So they say, no, I'm not going not gonna to have anything to do right now. But anyway, so, so I said, no, just take a look at it. You know, and, and most directors, they have their everything that they're doing. So, he, so again, he said, no. All right, so, so eventually he was going down an escalator, and if you know Josh, which many of you may, uh, he's, he's a very loud guy. Uh, he's going down the escalator and he said, okay, I'll try it. So, uh, so he took a look at it and he said, you know what, I think I'm gonna do this. And, um, and since then, he's had a lot of success with his program um, through this, and so he's actually um, speaking from a testimonial perspective, and he has gone all over the country with me um, talking about scale and rhythm chunks and, and this and uh, how it's benefited his program as well. So, uh, so that's a little bit about both of us. So first, before we uh, dive into the book and some other things, we have to look at what research says about motivation. Uh, motivation of students. These are the things that we all pretty much know. Um, first of all, students like to work on things that, that they like to play. If you put some you know, crazy, uh, crazy thing they've never heard of, you know, they're, they're not as motivated by that to be getting fan. Um, they like to receive some recognition for their accomplish, uh, accomplishments, whether it's affirmation or it is uh, some sort of physical reward, like a gift or an incentive, prizes, those kind of things. Um, some students like to have some friendly competition between their classmates. Uh, we just have to make sure that we harness that a little bit. And then uh, uh, students really like to have ownership in their learning. They like to be in control. Uh, and so we, we want to foster that. Also, students really love instant gratification. They like to be successful now. Um, I like this shirt. I want that shirt. I want instant gratification, and I want it now. Um, students live in what I would say is the get it your way right away society. That's the old Burger King slogan, right? Um, and that means that basically, if you think back to at least when we were kids, there were no, there was not Google, there was not Siri, there was none of that stuff. So you had to go to a library to look something up. You had to look at an encyclopedia. And now they can just say, hey Siri, find me a flute fingering chart or whatever it is. And they have it, boom, just like that. It's amazing. And so they live in an instant gratification world, and we have to be aware of that. 
So as a result, quick success is the key to motivation. We have to find out what makes our students tick. We have to find the way that it's going to be easy for them to achieve success quickly so that they can move on and want to achieve more success. You know, if you, it's the old success breeds success phrase. Find a way to, uh, to make it easy for them to feel that success. And the good old KISS method, keep it simple and stupid or keep it simple and silly. Um, you're not allowed to say stupid. Uh, but that's finding the, the easiest way is typically the best way, and students like that. Um, this is really important. Show students that you care about them and praise their progress. We go 100 miles an hour on a daily basis to accomplish everything we need to accomplish in our job, and we can easily forget to praise our students for all the wonderful things that they do. So that's important. Um, one of my favorite things to do is when a student accomplishes something really big, is to call home. And not just call home, like later on after class. Call them up and keep them after class, write them a pass, and get on the phone and call their parent right then. And I had a student, it's one of my favorite stories, I had a student several years ago named PJ, and he was a uh, percussionist, came into the program and said, um, I'm a drummer, moved from another school. And I said, well, we're all percussionists here, so, um, so you're gonna play percussion. And he said, I'm, I'm, I play the drums. So I talked to his mom, and I, and, you know, early on, and we had a conference about what his expectations were. And I said, you know, we, we play all these instruments as percussion. We play now, we play, you know, snare drum, and bass drum, etc. And she said, well, my boy is a drummer. So we went through all this for months and months. Eventually, um, DJ was he was playing a bell part back in the back of the band room, and he he just did not want to read, and not. To, but that day in, in rehearsal, a light bulb went off just started reading, took off, he understood what he was doing. And so I said, I stopped the, the whole band and I said, this was a uh, seventh grade band, and I said, DJ, what are you doing? He goes, what? And I said, you just, that was awesome, you're reading. And he goes, I know. That's awesome. And then after, after class, I said, hey, I want you to come up here. So he came up and we called his mom, and I said, hey, I, I've, got, I've got your son here. And she said, what did he do? And I said, well, he became a percussionist today. He's reading, he's doing a phenomenal job, and I want you to know I'm really, really proud of him. And she said, you get him on the phone right now. So we got him on the phone. First, I actually scared her at first because she thought, you know, so it was even better. That's that's gratifying for me. So we get we get her on, on the phone, and you could just hear her. Just, my baby, my baby, I'm so proud of you. This is so awesome. You know, it's great. So those moments are what, are what we need more of in our lives. Right? So we need we need to have more of that. We forget about that because we move so quickly. So tell your students you're proud of them and do it all. All right. So when we're teaching our kids how to practice, we all know what we want them to do. Uh, we want to make sure that they don't just read from the top to the bottom, but they actually take the music and break it down into small sections or bigger chunks. Uh, we want them to find the hard spots. We want them to focus on those first. Uh, we uh, we want to eliminate the just run it. And, and hopefully we're not doing that in our rehearsals uh, as well. And, and we want to make sure that our kids are what they're best at, which is being patient. Uh, we, uh, we want to avoid the student approach to practicing, which is of course, run through the song over and over and over, making the same mistakes all the time, or play until you make a mistake and quit, which we have found to be true in, uh, in our students. And so we have challenges in our beginning band classrooms, especially those of you who raise your hand for the one time a week or the two times a week when you see your fifth grade. Uh, we need all of the time with our beginners, but we often get the least amount of time with our beginners. We tend to get the most amount of time with our uh, upper level ensembles, our high school ensembles. Uh, we always say we don't have enough rehearsal time, and it's probably true. It would be great if we could all double and triple our rehearsal times, but uh, you know, we, we certainly don't have that. Uh, I can't take time away from my rehearsal to assess every single student, and we find that to be uh, a problem in our classrooms. Uh, and then, of course, I've got a concert. My administration needs me to play a concert every quarter. We don't have time to take away from rehearsal because of that. All right, so a little story behind the whole idea of chunks. Uh, those of you that said you have band, uh, beginning band one day a week, um, my program years ago, this goes back about 14 years ago, 
uh, the principal who I, I really loved at the time came up, I really did, came up and said, um, hey, I need you to, to make some sacrifices. We are going to, um, we're going to have to cut the band program down um, to, to one day a week. And, and I was obviously not very happy about that, but I said, okay, tell me about it. And she said, well, you're going to have your little pullout class. It will be like 30 minutes, and then you're going to have a, a um, uh, kind of a rotational class. So the students, when they go to recess from lunch, they're going to come in. One homeroom is going to come in, and then they're going to leave actually like 10 minutes into the class. They're going to go out. Another class will come in, and then they're going to leave 10 minutes later, and another class will come in. And I said, well, how am I going to rehearse as an ensemble? And she said, I'm really sorry, but it should be, the schedule should be fixed in a couple of years. <laughs> and I, I said, well, you know, I really, I, I don't know what to do with this. You know, and she said, well, I'm going to do everything I can, but I don't, I don't know if it'll, it'll be short term or long term. So I went home and I thought, okay, my program's going to go down the, down the tubes. This is the end for me. It's over. Life is terrible, you know. And I talked to my wife, who uh, was a first grade teacher at the time, and I, and she said, well, you ought to look at it like how we, uh, we teach making words. In, in first grade, we talk about um, you know you take bake and then you, you take the b off and you put t on there and you take take and then you take little portions of words you add other words onto them and you, you kind of put little chunks of the words together and I thought chunks that's it so of course like everything in life a good husband gives all the credit to their wife so she says you got to make sure you always tell people that I'm right and I'm the reason so. Um, but anyway, she was very right, um, and so what I did was I, I had that rotational class. I couldn't teach them all together because when I started to teach them a piece or something out of the method book, they would, they would leave, and it was very frustrating. So I created a level of fifth grade uh, scale chunks and fifth grade rhythm chunks, a level of sixth grade scale chunks and a level of sixth grade rhythm chunks, and I gave them to the students. And I put a little generic wall chart that I drew up on the wall, um, and I, I gave them like dry erase marker at the time. And I handed them out to him and I said, okay, I'm going to just go around and assess you, thinking this is, this is it, this is going to be terrible, I don't know what's going to happen. And within a week I had fifth graders playing chromatic scales and I had, um, they were counting through complex rhythms and they were saying we need more levels. So in two weeks here I am creating a third level and a fourth level and it's just getting crazy. And uh, the students were taking off and I wasn't teaching. So I thought something is really crazy happening here and like my program is getting cut. I better not tell my administrators about this because my program's getting cut and it's getting better. And I don't understand what's happening. So, so I thought there's something to this. So, um, so what, what I did was from there, like I, I mentioned, I, I did a pilot study with some other directors and I did, as part of my master's degree, I did a research uh, project on this. And, uh, and then I eventually I took it to Josh and other directors. So, um, so that's kind of the story behind, behind Chunks. Um, our ultimate goals as band directors, um, we want, obviously, we want the material that we, te that we teach to be retained. We also want, speaking of retention, we want our students to stay in our program, right? We don't want to just teach them to be getting banned and then they get frustrated and quit and they don't go on. And then, above all, we want our students to love music. Um, so I think those three things are really important to keep in mind. And so what, what we have found, and, and we talk about uh, the word assessment, and, and we'll talk about uh, kind of the requirements that are placed on uh, Ohio teachers here in, in a little bit, and we're all familiar with what, what is here and now and is happening, but uh, without the assessment, our students are gonna have bad habits. And uh, uh, we can get into assessment a little bit later, but, but when we say that, we just really mean without that, I hear you play one-on-one, -on -one and I can assess your playing. And so without that, our students are gonna have bad habits. Uh, all of this can happen, and, uh, and we have all seen that, and it's the person who's hiding in the corner, uh, kind of fingering, looking at the person next to them, or, or it's the person who just has a really bad embouchure and they're not playing quite loud enough, but the band sounds fine, and so that student is going to develop those habits, and they're going to continue to stick with them. Uh, we also have the students, and most of us were probably the student, where we excel so quickly that I'm now sitting at the end of the trumpet line and I'm waiting for these folks next to me to catch up. And now I'm completely bored and so I'm goofing off in class or I'm wanting to leave because this isn't worth my time anymore because my director's dealing with all of these problems instead of allowing me to have something to keep me motivated. And so uh, 
those students, the gifted students, the all-state students, are the ones that might lose the interest and then eventually quit your program as well, which is a tragedy. So I mentioned uh, the SLO, the OTES, all of that good stuff. Uh, my wife is actually a, a high school principal in a neighboring district, and uh, we get to talk about this a lot, and it's safe because she's not my principal. Uh, so we can discuss back and forth from different perspectives uh, the, the demands placed on teachers, and especially music teachers. And uh, one of my uh, senior percussionists, her father is an assistant principal in a different school district. And so I can uh, ask all these folks, what do you need to see from, from your band directors especially, and, and their big thing is they need to see individual assessment and differentiated instruction. And we all do that all the time, but now we have to show that we do that. And so uh, hopefully you have found ways to do that. Uh, this Chunks program has allowed me to do it in 10 seconds a day. I can just show them, here's what we're doing, this is how it's made my teaching better, this is how it's making my students' lives easier. And so this piece has really been important and instrumental in, in my use of the Chunks program. All right, so a little bit about the book. Um, before we talk about the second edition, talk about the things that are, are just standard in the book, uh, the layout of it and uh, that kind of thing. Um, there are four levels of rhythm-based technical exercises, so counting and clapping. Um, there's four levels of scale-based technical exercises, so playing on instruments. Um, within those four levels of scale-based exercises, there are chunk challenges, um, which are familiar songs that are as practical application of the concepts that are taught in the, uh, the exercises leading up to them. For our percussionists, uh, there are four levels of snare drum exercises along with the mallet exercises, which are their scale chunks. So they are uh, bronze, silver, gold, and platinum levels. Um, each chunk, to make it simple, uh, is, is going to be very, it's going to be short, it's going to uh, make each uh, exercise easy and, uh, and, and learning for the students easy. Uh, they're going to achieve success quickly. Um, and that's of course, like we talked about before, that's going to motivate students to move on to the next exercise and experience more success. And above all, so we're trying to find the way to individually assess your students uh, and make it easy and also um, create a, a really easy way to have differentiated so before you use the chunks, there's a couple things that you have to do because you're, this is not where we say, okay, um, everybody in the class is going to do chunks one and two. No, it's not. It's everybody starts out with the book and go as far as you can. And there will be students that will finish the book in three months, which means they're playing every major scale in fifth grade. It will happen. I'm here to tell you. It's crazy because you have those gifted students in your class and they're just waiting. When do I get to learn this? And they just stay there with the class. But they can take off, they can soar. So um, in order to, to not have the separation between you know, the students that are gifted and the students that are, that are struggling and have them kind of having this against each other, jealousy and all those different things, you have to teach them about differentiated instruction. So we need three volunteers right now. Three volunteers, raise your hand if you would like to volunteer. Don't be shy, it'll be fun. One, two, one more. One more. Three, you're up. Okay, come on up here. Give him a hand for Bob. Yeah, that's right. Come on. Right. You so. have to perform chunk number four. No, I'm <laughs> All right, so this is a podium right here. Right, we all know that. Okay, so what's your name? Jeremy. Jeremy, awesome. Jeremy, you get probably the hardest job. I want you to stand right there by that little black piece of paper. Okay, all right, what's your name? Chanel. Chanel. Jeremy? Chanel. And I don't know. Whatever. Okay, so Janelle. Okay, Janelle, come over here. You're going to stay right there. Great. And Chris. Chris, come on over here. Actually, no Chris. Okay, Chris is going to go right here by the camera. No, you're not going to be, you know. Okay. You guys can take a picture of you right now. Face the podium if you would. One of the volunteers. Watch out for this right here. Okay, so Jeremy, what I'd like for you to do. Now, I want, I want all of your help because you guys are, are the, the other folks in the rehearsal. And so you're going to encourage them. You're going to you're going to be behind them every step of the way. Okay? Jeremy, I'd like you to take three steps and touch this podium. I think you can do it. Let's see if we can. One, two, three. Touch that. How about three? Three steps. 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 Touch that podium. One, two, three. She made it. Come on, I was now, since we 
we did this in Texas one time, and there there was a, it was a really big auditorium, and um, a, uh, a, one person that was doing this where where Chris is um, uh, rolled all the way up. Um, you cannot you cannot roll. You cannot, <laughs> you cannot do cartwheels. You cannot. Uh, although that was very entertaining. Um, you just actually have to take three steps, Chris. So one, two. Oh, Ooh. oh, oh terrible. That's not very encouraging, is it? Now, how about this, though, this perspective? She is way closer than when she started, right? And, and you're going to have students that are going to be like, that's not fair. She was too far. She was farther away than everybody. Well, you know what? She came the furthest out of everybody. I mean, she, look at the distance that she came. So you point this out to the students, and the students are going to go, you can just see that they're like, wow. And Josh has a really cool story for me. Yeah, and so, this with the students. So I, I love to tell my students that she may not have gotten to the desk, but she's a lot closer today than she was yesterday. And one time, my students kind of figured out what was going to happen with that last person. And so he asked a couple of people next to him, hey, pick me up, carry me to the desk. And I thought about that and it just warmed my heart because the students are going to carry their student up to the desk. How poetic is that? It's just it's so fantastic. And this is exactly the kind of atmosphere that allows a band to become a band and not just a bunch of fifth graders in a class with the instruments, right? And so this demonstration not only teaches them about differentiated instruction, it teaches them how to care about each other and how to be better people. And uh, that's kind of the reason why we exist anyway. So can you give these folks a hand? Okay. Make sure that you see us for your I Heart Chunk shirt after the presentation. <laughs> Wear with pride. That's right. Um, and so, Josh has a little saying, and he just threw it in there, actually. Yeah, um, so I, I, I said this uh, last year uh, at a band director academy that we were uh, able to, to present the Chunks Clinic to. And uh, just in the middle of the clinic, I, I told the story that I just told you, and, and I got going a little bit because I'm an emotional guy. And, and I said, we all exist as band directors to make each other better. And, and we want our students to all exist to make each other better. And, and Richard calls this the golden rule of band. Everyone in the room exists so that everyone in the room can get better. It's the reason that we're here right now at this conference, not just to sit here and then to go have fun later, that will happen, but uh, we also exist so that everyone in here can get a little bit better at their job and we can support each other and encourage each other. And what a great method uh, to be able to do that. Okay, so here's what is new in the second edition. Uh, the, the first edition, the exercises from the first edition and the second edition are basically the same, but there's a whole lot more bells and whistles things to make your, your students uh, more successful, to help them be more successful. Uh, first of all, there are fingering charts, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this a little bit later, um, uh, and, but before I, before I move on, actually, um, I was looking at putting fingering charts into this book, and so I was looking around online at like, different examples of things, and I, I happened to, to come across this website um, from Stepwise uh, Publications, and uh, and actually, if you saw, there was a really great jazz clinic this morning at 9.30 with Curtis Winters, um, and Curtis is actually right over here. He's from Utah, um, and he, he had these fingering charts that were extremely innovative and completely different than what you would see in, in the back of a method book, and I was just so amazed by this, and I went out on a uh, kind of a long shot. I, I sent an email to him, and he replied back in like, boom, like five minutes, and um, and he was willing to kind of partner up with us. So we have his fingering charts in the book. So Curtis is awesome. If you get a chance, come talk to him because he has a wealth of knowledge and resources uh, through his website. Um, and he, uh, actually fingeringcharts.org, which is really great, and a lot of really uh, some free things in there and some other great resources that you can purchase. So there are fingering charts. We'll talk a little bit more about them and show you some examples in a bit. Dynamic guides. Uh, there are guides in each book for the wind players to show the change in speed of airflow. So we're going to be talking about breathing gym applications for the book. Um, percussion guides also have stick and mallet height um, for each dynamic as well. Some pictures of that. There is an, um, these are all in each level, by the way. They show them as they're introduced. But in the front of the book, it's kind of like one-stop shopping. So it'll show you um, the full guide of dynamics, the full guide of articulation, and everything easy to explain. So articulation, same thing as well. And then for percussion, all of the rudiments are laid out from easiest to most difficult. 
uh, on two pages. And then for the terms that are introduced in the book, uh, things like legato, that, that type of thing, those are in there as well. Also new in the second edition, um, we, we heard from many directors uh, <coughs> after the first edition um, that was published that um, having boxes around the notes was blending in with the, with the staff and the ledger lines above the staff, and so it was hard to read. So I changed those to ovals around the notes. Also, uh, particularly in the percussion, but in all the exercises, the, the font and, and the exercises are larger. Um, this book is also used by some New Horizons bands, um, so older senior citizens, and, and it wasn't really fair to them. Um, here you're reading the percussion exercises, and they're like like that, and they're doing that is just not good. So that's that much, much bigger. Um, there were some errors, just like any first edition, if you see in a, in a method book, you'll see errors in the first edition, and then they fix them. So there, there are no errors in this edition. Um, more focus on each instrument's technique. In the last book, there was a flute oboe book combined. This uh, this time around, there's a flute book and an oboe book, and there are, it, uh, there are discussions or, or uh, descriptions in there about important things to keep in mind when you're playing a different register, like you're playing the altissimo register, for example, suggestions on how to approach that. Um, and like I mentioned before, there are now applications in the Breathing Gym series. Um, this book is actually published through Focus on Music, which is the same publishing company as the Breathing Gym which many of you, how many of you know the, the breathing gym? Great. So uh, because we're, we're able to, uh, to do some great things with them, and, and we've done some clinics with Pat Sheridan, and the breathing gym, um, we're able to, to uh, uh, put that in there as well. So a um, couple things with, uh, with Chunky. So when you start to actually implement this program, uh, there are a couple of fast rules, and the students need to know the rules of chunks. And uh, the first rule is the chunks have to go in order. Because a lot of times, the students, like maybe we did, will flip to the last chunk and say, I can do that one. And you'll say, hey, good for you. Check off the rest first. <laughs> uh, they have to go in order. Because like Richard said, this is a hierarchical concept. We want to build every new chunk onto the previous chunk so then we have a wealth of knowledge. Um, we also want to perform our rhythm chunks by clapping and counting. Uh, we'll talk about that in just a little bit. And uh, the scale and snare chunks are performed on the instruments. So you have the rhythm piece uh, for, for just learning how to count, learning how the rhythms work, and then you have the playing piece so that you are becoming literate on your own instrument. These are our wall charts. Uh, we find great success in using the wall charts. Uh, you can use a sticker or a marker to fill in a different color month. Uh, Richard's gonna throw one up here. You can see uh, this star sticker was the very first one, so everybody got that done. And then you can see this person did four in that first month where uh, this person was at two. Everyone is showing their own growth. Obviously, it's differentiated because this guy got all the way done in this year with uh, his rhythm chunks. Some of them are still progressing. Uh, everybody is moving at their own pace. It's one of my absolute favorite pieces of the Chunks program, is that I can meet you right where you are at your ability level today, and I can make you better. Uh, I have a poster in the front of my room that says, get better today, and the Chunks allow every student to do that where they are, which is the most important. The best part about that is that you're not gonna have to mark anything in a grade book. Um, so if you tell a student, yep, you got that, mark it off. All they do, they go over and they mark their progress on the wall. You can go over and check on that later uh, and, and see that. Uh, so with the rhythm chunks, uh, what you're seeing on the left side is the rhythm guide that would be on, this is not all on one page, that's like the left page, which goes right next to the right page when you open it up. So this is a guide over on the left, and uh, you can actually go home, students can go home, have all the concepts there. Uh, if you're there performing them, you can actually close up the book and just use the right side if you know that they're there. It's kind of like um, you know, free information there on the left, and that's not harming anybody by having an on-purpose cheat sheet. Yes. Uh, with the rhythm chunks, they're performed by counting and clapping. I always tell my students you must be confident counters, because at first you know they'll be like, one, two, three, two, three. can't hear them, so you gotta be confident. The chunk clap, which we'll be uh, talking about later, everybody take two fingers and hold them up like this. The one hand, two fingers in this hand. Hit them together as hard as you can. That's as loud as it is. So when, when you do that, when you're going around and, and checking people off on, on chunks, we'll talk about later, um, and you can do this with some airflow exercises as well. Um, it's not super loud. Um, and so when we do breathing exercises, uh, we can use those with rhythm chunks as well. 
And then, of course, you actually can play rhythm chunks by playing a repeated scale pattern on uh, each measure. So the layout of the, of the rhythm chunks, we already saw bronze. Silver moved into some 16th note subdivisions and, um, and uh, eighth rests and things like that. Gold rhythm uh, moves into, and again, these are sequential. So it's going one, one uh, you know, element at a time. Uh, this is moving into cut time, and then 6 8, 9 8, eventually moving into going back and forth between 2 4 and 6 8. Platinum rhythm chunks uh, going into complex meters and actually moving back and forth between, you know, um, like 5 8, 4 4, 7 8, that kind of thing. And number 40 is what we call the kitchen sink because um, it has absolutely everything that you could possibly throw into it. It's really pretty cool. Um, as far as quick assessment goes, um, we can tell you that it is really easy to assess and it won't take much time, but we're going to show you. So everybody, what we're going to do is we're going to do a regular clap. So everybody take two hands and just set them together as hard as you can. Now, good, it's loud. Okay, cool. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do top of the counter. So we're going to keep, we're going to use the counting system of one and two and three and four. And on the rest, if you just bring your hand out here on the rest and go ahead and clap the rhythm and count out loud the subdivision. Let's do it. Two and ready and go. So, uh, so like basically 10, 10 seconds or so, you can assess every individual student, which is really great. Um, because when we normally do our assessments, think about the time you spend just sitting there listening, listening, and it goes on and on. And really, we're just we're attacking the concepts that they're learning, and they're showing you right now what they can do. Moving on, having full success. With airflow, let's go back to the chunk clap. Hit that chunk clap for me, go. Good. So now we can hear our airflow. So what we're going to do is while we do this, we can actually blow air. We're, we, you could do this with hissing, um, but we're going to do it with like, like this. You listen, it's going to go. Which if you hear me, you can't hear that as much, but if you do it as a whole ensemble, you can. So we're going to do the rhythm. We're going to now internalize our counting, and we're going to use airflow out this one. Ready? One, and two, and ready, and go. Good. So that's one way you can use some of that. So, so here is one of my sixth grade students, and uh, he worked long and hard on uh, going through his chunks. Uh, and, and this is chunk number 40. And uh, I heard him practice it many, many times. And, and several times I had to say, hey, you're making good progress. Now work on this measure. And so go ahead and let them hear how chunk 40. And he ended up in the year 2B, and 2B, and 2B. 